There should be no doubt in any historian's mind that the Age of Conquest affected all the races of Loomis. Even a cursory inspection of the history of the races before the Age of Conquest will reveal clear differences in behavior and habits. Most historians believe that the madness of those years was caused by unchecked greed and a sense of mistrust between the various races and cities involved. However, there are those who claim that there are greater, darker forces at play, powerful forces that took advantage of the mistrust and xenophobia between the races and intentionally fed and nurtured the seeds of conflict over the years. Then, when the time was right, these forces triggered the flames of war creating a devastation that encompassed all of Luforia. Excerpt from An Introspective on the Age of Conquest, Kathak Galashin. Hang you my bondage you make yourself more than just a man, if you Hang devote yourself to the night, and if they can stop you, then you become Hang something else entirely. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. In the past, I've talked about my fascination with video game-inspired tabletop RPGs. The more canny among you may recall that I did a panel discussion on that very topic. In particular, I have an interest in the fantastical end of this equation. You see, I find that far too many have a frankly incorrect assessment on what qualifies as fantasy. Specifically, that in order for something to qualify as fantasy, it has to fall into a British high medieval set of trappings, or at least a pastiche therein. This is especially irksome when applied to console-style RPGs like Dragon Quest, Final Fantasy, or the Tales of series. There might be some similar elements, but works like that are a pastiche of different elements made into its own identity more than anything else, hence why I've used the term Gestalt fantasy so frequently. This brings us to Endless Realms, a game that wears its influences on its sleeve, depicting a multi-dimensional world centered around the corporeal realm of Loomis and the adventurers within. How does it hold up? Let's find out. Endless Realms is a fairly packed book at 338 pages, with some absolutely amazing art throughout. There's no shortage of color within, and the writing keeps things flowing throughout the book, However, this is one entry that seems to be more for a PDF format than a physical one. There's a good amount of hyperlinks within the document, but unfortunately there's a severe lack of an index within the book. This isn't as bad of an issue with the use of bookmarks and links, but I have to maintain my rules. Character creation is a seven-step process here, and we'll be exploring this with a young knight named Joseph Delinar. Step 1 is Race and Adventurer Class, the starting combination of our character that will act as a foundation. We'll be going with Human and Knight, respectively. Our choice of Human grants us plus 1 Luck and Balance saves, a free rank in the Collaboration Talent as well. In addition, the Startling Endurance and Spirit Magnet attributes, and the Reckless Abandon Vice. As a Knight, we'll start with 10 HP and 6 MP. Each class has a set of skills from leveling and our path, a specialization unique to that class. As a knight, we get to select a knight's code and gain its associated skills. In our case, we'll go with Code of Valor. This means that we gain the Catch, Protector, and Master of Arms abilities from being a knight, and the Champion's Courage, Rally the Field, and Stalwart Shield abilities from the Code of Valor, and one first level ability, in, a, in our case, Enter the Fray. Step 2 is stats, specifically trainable, inherent, vital, and unique saves. First is trainable stats. There's a total of 5 of these, starting with 1 point in each, and we have to allocate 6 points into these, with no stat getting more than 4 points total. In our case, we'll go with Strength 3, Dexterity 2, Agility 3, Focus 2, and Spirit 1. Second is inherent stats, which start at 0, and we may distribute 18 points between each. As a human, our luck starts at 1, and our final spread is Willpower 4, Luck 3, Awareness 7, and Presence 5. Third is Vital Stats, primarily Health, Mana, and Stamina. Health and Mana are based on class, but Stamina starts at 4, plus each point in Strength, Dexterity, and Agility. This makes our Stamina out to be 12. Fourth is Unique Saves, which start at 0, and we can allocate 6 points between the 4 saves 
with none higher than three. In our case, we'll go with disable two, condition two, balance two, and magic one. Step three is talents, akin to skills in traditional affairs. We have 18 points to spend on ranks in talents, capped at the talents relevant stat. In our case, we'll go with acrobatics three, climbing three, foraging one, swimming one, tracking two, etiquette one, judge character one, street smarts one, collaboration one, geography two, history one, and wilderness two. Step four is virtues and vices, which is a self-explanatory affair. We already have a vice from being human as mentioned before, and we'll go with honest as our virtue. Lastly, equipment. We have three salt to spend, which can convert into 300 loom. We'll spend this on a long sword, simple hide armor, and a small shield, which leaves us with one soul and three loon left over. Character creation is going to be a bit book jumpy for some. In a weird way, it reminds me of the organization quirks of RPGs from the 2000s, where the integration of fluff parts into the crunch. I think a full-on summary page is needed, and the overview early on doesn't really suffice. Also, there's a few things that had me tilting my head. Namely, the choice to pick race and class first before going into stats. But that might be just a habitual thing on my end. Honestly, I would have reversed those and added some aside for what stats would be favored by what playstyle. In addition, the naming conventions are going to trip people up, since skills and talents in endless realms are the opposite of what those words typically imply, especially if you're um, genre savvy like I am. It's not a bad system, but it could stand to use some quality of life adjustments. Endless Realms uses a roll-high d10 system. However, instead of this die being compared to a target number, checks are contested with the difficulty of the roll being used as a modifier for the GM. Furthermore, a natural 1 and 10 are critical blunders and successes, respectively, adding or subtracting 5 to the roll. Given that this means that there's a 10% chance to crit or botch, I could see it argued for since it's not an automatic result. Also, the GM's role cannot benefit from that 10% chance, only the players. Combat has its own quirks, the first of these being that it's hex-based instead of grid-based, something that's fairly uncommon in games. Second, instead of having a hierarchy of actions, the game uses a pool of action points. 10 AP for characters is the magic number, with normal actions costing 7 AP, short action costing 3, and quick actions costing 1 and free actions being, well, free. Damage from attacks is split into low and high values, with the latter happening if the attack versus defense roll has a sum of three or more. Of course, this only denotes raw damage before damage reduction applies. When it comes to the pure mechanics, the game keeps things fairly simple, though I can't help but wonder if the game could do with some equivalent to inspiration or a means of mixing up the die probabilities. While the use of positive and negative modifiers for advantage and disadvantage is nice, this is one instance where I think the roll to drop one method might help the game give that part of a better line between the two. More often than that though, I could see some issue being taken with the game using an XP as currency and a leveling system in Endless Realms. I don't necessarily agree, but I could see the argument that it should go one way or the other. Now, normally I'd go into the magic system, but like 13th Age, this is one case where magic use is not a universal system. So join me a bit as we delve into each class's approach. Something I should note is that casting and non-casting classes have a different advancement method. For the latter, the skills they can access are solely based on their level, gaining a new one with each level, while the former has a set of spells per rank that they can access. This also affects their paths, since the latter gains skills from their path immediately, while the former gains a single effect when choosing their path and additional effects at 7th, 13th, and 19th level. For example, a starting Animus has three rank 1 slots, while a 4th level 1 would have 6 at 1st rank and 4 at 2nd rank. Speaking of the Animancer, that's our first casting class. Animancers are themed around dualism, drawing power from their dual god Ilnor and Zelenor. This allows them to use the Animus energy in the form of life and death spells, which can be empowered on a black and white scale, 
but going too far towards life or death empowerment risks their respective curses. Barbarians are a skill class whose skills can be treated as spirit or astral spells for the purpose of certain effects, but this especially applies to their skills with the vocal subtype, which allow for the supernatural effects as the barbarian channels wrathful spirits through the sound of their voice. Dancers are a spell-based class that utilize chaos energy for their magic. Many of the spells they can call upon are rooted in dances that provide continuous effects or allusions to beguile foals, sometimes both at once. However, chaos magic is still chaotic, and some spells may call for a chaos effect to be rolled on a D100 check. The dandy is akin to a fencer in other games, and has a skill-based class that uses stances and taunts to great effect in their tactics. A dandy starts with an offensive and a defensive stance, and certain skills they may unlock can only be utilized in one of these stances. Elementalists are a spell-based class that utilize six forms of elemental energy, fire, ice, wind, earth, lightning, and water. The importance of these is that some spells require the presence of that elemental energy to utilize the spell. Afterwards, the energy utilized will remain in the area in a reduced state. A seventh element is also present as a joker called unity. In addition, many elementalist spells can be channeled to extend their effects. Judicars are a spell-based class that utilizes order energy. It'd be easy to compare them to clerics or white mages. Effectively, these are casters whose abilities allow them to understand and bend the rules of the world through laws, or utilize predefined triggered effects through the use of their runes. Knights are a skill-based class that has more in common with a non-supernatural paladin or warlord, due to the fact that they focus less on forward aggression and more on being a team player. More importantly, their code of honor chosen at creation will determine a set of actions they have to follow or risk losing their path benefits. Ninja are another skill-based class who may utilize their repertoire while holding tools or weapons alike. In addition, several skills take the ninja's choice of path to account for additional effects. Shrine Keepers are a spell-based class that utilizes spirit energy for their spells. Arguably one of the most gish classes of the group, some of the spells can be treated as skills for the purposes of their effects while their seal and talisman-based spells act like their own variant of the Judicar's runic spells. Adding to this hybrid nature is the fact that their choice of path can lead one of two forms, dedication or monastic. This is an indication of whether they lean more towards the martial arts or the magical end of the Shrine Keeper's repertoire. A third form, centrist, acts as a middle ground between the two extremes. Lastly, Wardens are a skill-based class that would fit within the Ranger niche of characters. True to form, they emphasize mobility and range combat to stay out of the fray. While there's a bit of a lean towards spellcasters getting some more attention, I have a hard time seeing why two separate forms of advancement are needed overall. Perhaps I prefer a degree of unification in this, but it's something that bugged me within the design. Fortunately, it's not a quadratic wizard's level of issue in this case. As much as I find the phrase overused, Endless Realms is a game that subverts expectations. Some of this is no doubt my own fault for covering so many RPGs over the years. You tend to see certain patterns form. Several of those are turned on their head, especially with naming conventions. That said, I do feel that core stats are a little more divorced from the rest of the system than I would like. But again, this may be a consequence of me being so used to the attribute skill formula. However, the game also suffers from the D&D problem in the case that it's clearly a sandbox within its world, but the lore of that world isn't quite as detailed as it could be. It's a half-in, half-out approach with the world of Loomis. I don't blame anyone for it in this case, since there's only so much room to be had, but I kept having this feeling like I was going through the Player's Guide version of a book set with a Player and GM Guide, despite the latter not existing. All that said, I would give Endless Realms a stamp of recommended. However, I will place the caveat that if you get this game, make absolutely sure you have the Creature Compendium alongside it, and be prepared to fill some blanks to make the setting yours. Old school players should be used to this kind of thing, but more narrativist gamers might struggle with that. Also, if you make crystals a major theme in your particular version of Loomis, well, it'd certainly be on brand.